Welcome to the course, Disaster Recovery and Build Back Better. My name is Ram Satish. I'm a faculty from Department of Architecture and Planning, Indian Institute of Technology, Roorkee. Today, we are going to talk about architecture at risk. So, today we are going to discuss about the theoretical component along with the implications, the practical implications with various variety of examples and how architecture as a domain it contemplates with the theory and especially in the post-disaster recovery practice. Whenever a disaster happens, we encounter a huge loss not only to the lives of people, to their properties, to the civic buildings, to the religious buildings, to the cultural heritage of the communities. For instance, in this photograph, what you are seeing is the Darbar Square in the Nepal, the recent Nepal earthquake. And many of the historic buildings, uh, which are under the UNESCO heritage, have been demolished. Now, a lot of efforts have been taken up in the reconstruction of these historic buildings. This place is known as Bhaktapur, which is listed under the UNESCO World Heritage Site in Kathmandu. It goes back to the 12th and 18th centuries where this particular square was traditionally used for the coronation ceremonies and the religious festivals. And many of the residential buildings got damaged. So there was obviously a need of reconstruction, not only from the shelter point of it, but also to rebuild the lost heritage. Similarly, in 2003 Bam earthquake in Iran, what you can see here is before and after the earthquake. What you can see here is a huge demolitions happened. You can see the rubble masonry, I mean the whole rubble fallen on the historical site. And it took almost more than a decade to rebuild the whole process, you know, the, each and every monument is worth, or each and every building of its, whether it is a merchant's owner, I mean merchant's house, or it is any civic building, or it is any fort. So it, it needs a very longer time to actually understand its historical significance, understand its materiality, and then reflect back with its historic integrity and within its historic context. This is one of the biggest challenge when an architect's work in a cultural settings, especially in the post-disaster recovery. Like here you can see a list of properties which are the state properties or the private properties and whether it is a citadel, whether it is a residences, whether it is a mosque, a religious buildings and uh, which are listed under the national heritage have been damaged by this earthquake. And then the recent efforts by various organizations from the German NGOs came forward to reconstruction and there's a kind of collaboration between the Iran government and as well as the German parts. And that is how they started working on like a few examples where uh, a merchant's house has been rebuilt by the clay brick work and they also use the kind of the fiber reinforcements and looking at the alternative materials which can sustain the earthquake in future as well. So how they are actually rebuilding these walls and also the arches, walls, these are because you need to regain the same form, you know, what kind of alternative materials one has to uh, you know, procure first of all and the skill, labor, how we can train them and the conservation. It is not just only the preservation or the reconstruction or the restoration process. We can call it as a kind of conservation project, which is a bigger umbrella of all these uh, components, which can include restoration, the reconstruction aspects. And that is where we deal with the authenticity of the uh, product, you know, what this particular heritage structure belongs to and how it has an uh, outstanding value. So how we can actually reflect that back when we are doing such kind of conservation works. 
So these are some of the challenges apart from our regular shelter and housing programs which we deal with normally in the disaster affected areas. We also deal with the identity, the place and identity issue, the space and place. Let's talk a little bit of the, in parallel, I would like to discuss about uh, the concepts of place and its identity. When we talk about place, many of the theorists, geographers, anthropologists, sociologists, they argue as place is a territorial instinct. It is a boundary which where a person feels safe, comfortable to live in. It is also a kind of survival instinct, which is normally referred with the geographical location by the Latin long and it also reflects through its material form and which is the physical features, whether it is the hill architecture, whether it is the coastal architecture, whether it is uh, through its natural settings and the built environments. More importantly, the place is associated with the meanings and the values that the people or the communities invest in them. So this is where the identity comes in. So many geographers uh, talk about place is a social construct. Doran Massey talks about it is a social construct and we actively make places and our ideas of place are products of the society in which we live. A small example for the students to understand. I hope many of you have seen the movie of uh, Castaway where Tom Hanks played a role of a courier person and he met with an accident in the flight, by uh, the courier flight and he is a lonely survivor. He finds himself in an island which an untouched island, no one ever been to that island and the whole story is all about how he lives in that place for four years. A civilized person, look at the excitement which he had of when he actually makes fire for himself. So he becomes a hunter, he becomes his own, he makes his own place, he makes his own habits. For the past four years, he develops his own uh, sense of place. One day, he gets a small food packet delivery from the shore. Uh, which actually float from the shore. Probably it could have been from the same accident. And then he finds a small football and he names it as Wilson. And Wilson becomes a company for him throughout his stay in that island. Here he talks about, he cares about Wilson, he talks about Wilson, he talks with Wilson, he shares his pain, anger, everything with him. So here, whatever, it is not just only for the food or the shelter, it is how a man makes his sense of belonging with other individuals, though it is not a living being, but he still makes some attachment. He lives here for four years and then one day he gets angry and he throws out that Wilson out. Then after four years, he will again find his way back to home. That night when he throws Wilson out in his anger, he again goes back and searches for Wilson. So he both love and emotions, uh, you know, play in a sequence. And when he was traveling back to the mainlands in a small boat, there's a huge hurricane comes and finally he loses his Wilson. So here, what I want to say here is, a man is attached with a lot of emotions, its values. Four years that ball has given him a sense of being, okay? That is where Sack talks about places cannot exist without us, but equally important, we cannot exist without places. Like some of the post-disaster experience which where my journey have started. This is Latur earthquake on the right hand side, recovery and the Gujarat earthquake, geodesic domes. The post-disaster context is always seen a very immediate need for both the beneficiaries and the providers. The providers, for them, it's a great need because they have to give a helping hand. 
For the people who lost their houses, for them there is an immediate requirement that they need to shelter their families. For that kind of pressurized situation, people tend to accept whatever they get for free or whatever they get. That is how it ended in Lato. Even today many houses are still empty. More than 20 years now, but still many houses you find they are abandoned. It is not now this situation opens us a dialogue of what kind of housing demand we have. Now, despite of having so many housing solutions, but why people are able to reject it? What is something beyond a house, beyond a building? It is far beyond it. The question is far beyond it. So that is where people may have rejected for their livelihood needs, the proximity, or their cattle needs, with their social needs, there are many other aspects, there are many other forces which make the people to take these choices. When I was traveling uh, during my master's time, immediately after the tsunami, I was traveling in Tamil Nadu. I was looking at how various agencies are working. Once I visited uh, the place where I worked earlier in Aruval, I was interacting with various architects and that is where the Aruval Building Center is proposing up some <coughs> housing options. So what you are seeing is a few photographs of the uh, building models which uh, the architects have demonstrated that these are the solutions which we may give. Having worked there, I also have an understanding what those architects have previously worked. I can see that there are some kind of imitations which people tend to imitate from their previous projects. Maybe the architect have worked on a similar project which is the real project. So as a terracotta roofing structure may have simplified this as a, uh, a module and proposing it as a kind of universal solution to develop a village or to develop a cluster, whatever it might be. So here one can see as an architect, as a professional, try to take an imitations from what already he has done. Now, for instance, there's another setting of this kind of uh, you know, raised house. So there is some different understanding how maybe the flood water can go beneath something like that. So different ideas. But here you can see the veranda concept, which is was traditionally uh, you can find today in Tamil Nadu as well. So when we talk about the theoretical understanding of the place and space, one of the important understanding one has to look at the Henry Refebres work, the production of space. He says the space is a social product and it offers a theoretical assemblages and tactics in which power, architecture and also their associated agencies alter and potentially dissolve the centrality of space in the depoliticized arena of the post-disaster recovery. How different forces can actually alter and transform the space. And it can also tend to shift its meanings. So that is where I can just briefly talk about what Lefebvre talks about. Lefebvre talks about three aspects. One is the conceived space, lived space, perceived space. Conceived space, which actually talks about the intellect. And here it is also a space that has been conceptualized or conceived by planners, scientists, which talks about the representations of the space. And these are based on certain visions, on certain principles, developed by decision makers. That is where we call conceived space is thus a knowledge and science in combination with an ideology. And Perceived space, the second form which he talks about, the space of spatial practice, where the movement and the interaction takes place and the networks develop and materialize. This is where the daily routines and the individual level as well as the networks keep building on. It is not only at the individual but also at the collective orders. So the lived space which is an unconscious 
a non-verbal direct relationship of humans to space, which is also a form of representational space. It is lived through various associations, through schemata, through images, through various symbolic aspects. And this kind of understanding where we have the intellect which conceives this, the instincts which develops these networks, and then the intuitions, you know, how it is understood through various images and the symbolic aspects. This whole lecture is developed based on one of the important articles by uh, Cameliano Bono and William Hunter, who actually developed an article on architecture at risk, the ambivalent nature of the post-disaster recovery. So I'm going to describe about a brief aspects which he described from a theoretical perspective, along with various understanding of what uh, I have understood about the project with various examples. Post-disaster spatial pra practice assemblages. There is a strong need that architecture as a theory has to contemplate on the transformation nature of the shelter practices, the built environment, especially in the post-disaster recovery, because it talks about both the short term, the medium and the long term adaptive practices. One of the another contribution which I would like to re refer is Paul Oliver's contribution on built to meet needs, where in part four he talks about the culture disasters and dwellings in a disaster context what happens. Ideally, our dependency on the built environment itself enhances vulnerability because we depend more on the built environment, we depend more on the shelters. Earlier when man was a nomad, when man was hiding in caves, that time the vulnerability component has a different meaning. But today our dependency of life I mean, our life dependence is more to do with the built environment. For instance, in Cappadocia, an example, in the central Antolia, where a lot of peasants live, and you can see these tufa rock pinnacles, which are actually formed from the ancient deposits of the lava dust. And because of the exposure to the air, and the soft rock hardens so that the interiors have firm walls. So people started dwelling these are all small dwellings and people started living in those houses. And as you know, the fault line passes through Turkey and it has been one of the earthquake prone area. And these pinnacles often collapse, destroying the dwellings. And you can see many of those have the Kavasin, which is a Greek village, which has actually been demolished. And Despite of these people given an opportunity to go back and some settle somewhere else, they came back and they settled because of various other reasons, because tourism is one of the important component people come, so that is where their livelihood is based on. So there are other associated reasons for it. The materiality of houses and problematic of spaces. Another example I would like to see. This is in Ghibellina case in Sicily when in 1968 a violent earthquake have destroyed. Almost one lakh people became homeless. And this is where the mayor of Kora have talked about looking at a cultural renaissance through the urban reconstruction of Gibellina. Earlier it was only a 5,000 inhabitants, but now they projected it for 50,000 people. So if you look at a huge squares, the monumental uh, aspect of architecture. And today what you are seeing in these pictures is no one is present. So the vastness of the project is so huge. The housing, where you can see earlier it was a more of an informal way of interactions with the neighbors. But because of, uh, you know, uh, we have the friend garden which, I, which is detaching the house from the street and it actually separates the neighbors, you know, so there's the social interactions were weakened. And the scale of parking, because the vastness, the, the kind of vastness 
they are projected it also has to implicate with the maintenance of the project and these particular squares the artistic they they also brought some artists various artists this has become almost like a huge competition there's a big platform for it. many creative people were invited and they asked to design this particular place and many artists came and they started working on that and these are all some exercises where to pull the community together and they can practice i mean they can develop a kind of participatory approaches but today what you are able to see is because of various other funding is issues today many of these artifacts are completely half finished or just lying abandoned so and uh, now what you can see is not many people are there and their economic regeneration the maintenance aspects there all many other issues came later on this is a the previously affected site this is a monument which the alberto buri have developed the crato in 12 hectares what they did was he made the whole skeleton of the village the settlement as it is and he made as a concrete mounds where it talks about a 1 meter height and uh, so that it becomes a memory a collective memory so he is trying to give a spatial dimension to the collective memory of the whole city turning a place of devastation and pain into a work of art but what we can see similar is both the crato and gabellina nova has one common thing which is silence the first is a city forever captured under a shroud of cement the crato is captured which is archaeology of archaeology as a reminder of the past and the second is a cemetery of houses squares monuments and unfinished infrastructure so that is one example when we talk about the philosophical aspect of place where especially we talk about the pursued space and the lived space where certain sense of emotional attachments plays on the daily where the habitat and hab habits interact with each other so the habit and habitat that is where as uh, kim dovi also talks about the uh, habitus he reflects about second birth bodio talks about second birth these are some of the refugee homes which were created by the ikea people from syria or afghanistan they were forcibly given these kind of prefab elements to use it could be a tent cities it could be camps it could be many other forms where because they are forced to enter into a different field so that is where they have to learn a different practice different set of rules different process how they were living in africa or how they were living in syria how they were living in afghanistan is very much different than what they have set up in turkey or what they have set up in belgium so that is where it takes time to adapt to the way they have to accustom with the new field and new game rules the relationship between home and homelessness is more complex than the simple presence or absence of home and the physical adequacy of the shelter so it is not just a part of the building it there is more meanings to it another aspect inherent complexity as practice and discipline there was never just one cultural context for providing shelter following a disaster it's always two they are just distinct one is the have and the other one is have nots the powerful and the powerless the relief organizations and the victims there's a two dialects of the process one is a giver one is a taker one is a intender one is the victim alan bartons perceived disaster as a part of larger character of collective stress situations which occur when many members of a social system fail to receive expected conditions of life from that system and more importantly especially the relief operation the traditional and local systems of organization are unlikely to be rejected in favor of systems familiar to and excised by the relief culture so whenever the relief organizations whether it is a world vision whether it is oxfam whether it is 
any other uh, um, Christian Aid or Red Cross, any other organization coming to these affected areas, they don't even consider what is a local system. So they simply believe that it is traditional in the local systems uh, or doesn't work. A victim culture is made aware of the failure of local traditional indigenous system to either anticipate the disaster or be able to cope up when it with it when it happens. So many attempts were made to make the victims realize that their traditional models are the reasons for this failure. And that is one thing one has to seriously think about it. You are coming from some other place. But then without understanding, a lack of understanding, we actually educate them that their system is not, is absolutely a failure. And we talk about the participatory methods. In many of the cases, we can see that we then the models and we can say, please select one of, we are giving you a choice. And then the poor man, thinks about, oh, let me take whatever I get for free. His situation is different before disaster and after disaster. The dynamics of the situation, the situational aspect changes from time to time. When you talk about participation, one has to interpret exactly what participation means and to whom it renders and the most ambiguous terms, the most powerful of the concepts. So we need to be clear on that participation aspect. These models, often driven by the top-down implementation, push of a result-driven solutions. They often expect a result, whether it is a dwelling, whether it is a habitat, whether it is a cluster, and is characterized by a limited variety of interventions. So because it's a project mode, so they all try to look at a limited variety of interventions. And the fragmentation of donors and agencies and political imperatives managing forcibly disabled populations. It is not just one agency dealing with everything. It is one agency dealing with shelter, another with service, another with livelihood. So different fragmented agencies come forward to help one beneficial community in different angles. So there is always a dialogue, there is a gap which occurs within this. Another aspect is the control paradigm. The aid industry culture where organizations struggle against the resistance of conservative supporters unwilling to invest in anything different from what they have funded before, where regulators are reluctant to approve anything they may lose control over. So the, even the aid agencies, they might have developed certain trial and error process, they might have tested certain models, and they want to implement these things, whether it is Japan, whether it is China, whether it is India, whether it is Sri Lanka, whether it is Bangladesh. If you are doing with a paper uh, waste structure, I mean, if the structure is made of paper waste, if it is worked out there, then they might try to impose this here as well. So they mostly think of uh, invest in what they have already tested, what they have already funded before. And similarly, the approving authorities, they also have a challenge in approving some new things because uh, how this could be tested, how this has to be validated. Technocracy and participatory rhetoric. We are living in a generation where the architecture profession in the disaster context has moved from a singular vision to a shared vision. In the first version of Build Back Better, where Michael Leons and other authors have demonstrated that various participatory approaches have being successful and obviously they also bought the pros and cons of each approaches and bringing various case examples like most of them they are talking about putting people in the center like we can see in some of the examples where South Indian Fisherman Federation societies Benny Kuriakos where uh, he have implemented a, a bottom-up approach of completely from the documentation to the design to the erection process. And the one-to-one -one consultation process has been, it's a time-taking process. Where Juno Berenstein and Shushma Anger, they talked about how the paradigms in the housing construction in India have shifted from the vulnerable self-built housing to the safe contractor-driven 
and they also emphasize on the owner driven problem approaches and also there are other aspects where that particular monograph discussed about the scaling up the owner driven process in various aspects addition how one household at a time the multiplication from one household to a hundred and the replication from one cluster to many clusters so this is where the different owner driven and contractor driven processes work especially in terms of the advancements of its built forms and how they develop a scheme a schemata or a model and then how they can replicate it whether in a scale of a uh, cluster whether in a scale of a settlement um, in that whole model so that is how there are both uh, pros and cons of each model also there are issues of land tenure and ownership the people who were having houses before and but who have lost their houses in the disaster maybe when the aid agencies support they may not give the tenure full tenure but the people who are not having houses who have a little money but now they could able to afford the land and then they have a tenure so there is always the discrepancies occur in the tenure and the ownership aspect you can see the responses what the aid agencies have given and what people have developed there is always the personalization is a natural res- response to the cultural deficiencies whether it is a kitchen whether it is a religious what you can see is a, dis- a toilet has been converted as a worship place so which means it is more to do with the religious aspects two brothers have extended one single roof to represent a family belonging so there is a family a lady who lost her husband in the tsunami she actually doesn't have any livelihood support so then she developed a house there was no place for people to play around so they started encroaching the public places nearby so there are many dimensions of how this place is conquered and how the place is modified normality and a normality of disasters relief agencies normally they rarely pay attention to the way in which housing is delivered often assuming that developing countries have no experience in low cost social housing schemes no finance mechanisms nor they do sometimes possess a fra- profoundly rich and established informal sector so this is a kind of belief system that when the relief agencies agencies come to the developing countries they think that these people doesn't have an experience how a self built programs work how a participatory mechanisms work that is the blind belief so if you look at the schematic understanding of what we have discussed that bono and uh, william hunter have come framed in a nice conceptual diagram where there is a reconstruction phase how it is programmed with different forces one is a discourse where the disasters the reconstructions and the usual development process work on you have the option and choices you have the relocation options you have the in situ you have the building typologies you have the international competitions so there is options and choices come forward this is a set of force land issues and tenures that's what i just discussed with you the ownership the renting and the squatting the materiality the scale of destruction the recurrent technology the geography of a disaster the displacement the type of housing and the construction risk the social relationships the social complexities the poverty poverty has a direct equation with the disaster risk and the vulnerability the marginalized representation systems who often get affected by the disaster power whether it is a local government whether it is an agency whether it is a feudal system so that is where there is the ideologies how they frame how they conceive the development the political capacity to exert control over funding and policies the development so that is where in short in summary ian davis reflects also shelter must not be considered as a process uh, i'm sorry uh, shelter must be considered as a process but not as an object and this whole set of uh, cases and examples which we are facing in our daily uh, observations it opens a call for more culturally sensitive approaches to home making or remaking in the aftermath of disasters so uh, 
the culture is very important and understanding of the philosophical understanding of place and space and the process of making a place is very important that an architect has to understand and this particular subject needs even further more debate to actually look at a reflective learning you know how we learn from the practice is very important i hope you understand thank you very much